Hi everyone, uh, this is Professor Shamsa Rizwan. I'm a professor in obstetrics and gynecology at PAF Hospital Islamabad. Um, my special area of interest is maternal psychosocial well-being and that is in which I have done my PhD as well. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about external cephalic version. Um, and as you know, uh, external cephalic version or the version of a breach or a transfer slide into a cephalic presentation is done so that we, a person can have a vaginal delivery. Um, there are the main prerequisite is that we take informed consent from the patient. And for an informed consent, I think it is very important to really explain a few things to her. So the first thing that I usually explain to my patients is that external cephalic version has to be done in cases of primary gravida at about 36 weeks and in case of multi gravida at 37 weeks. Uh, and after that, once we have done uh, external cephalic version and reverted the baby to a uh, cephalic presentation, the chances that the baby might revert back are very few, something like 5%. Also, we need to tell the patient that this procedure will reduce their chances of cesarean section and moreover it is possible that if a person does not have external cephalic version but still can revert to a cephalic presentation after 37 weeks by itself but the chances are minimal they are again about five to eight percent so having said that we need to discuss all of these things to those patients who really require external cephalic version. And of course, patients who cannot deliver vaginally should not be offered. For example, if a person has placenta previa, we cannot offer external cephalic version. There's no use. Uh, but there are certain contraindications also. So, so let us discuss those. So one of those is um, twin pregnancy. Of course, it's difficult to revert the babies in twin pregnancy. So that is one. Uh, if a person has severe preeclampsia, if a person has history of bleeding or APH in the last five days, or if there is any CTG abnormality, also people who have ruptured membranes. So these are some of the absolute contraindications. A person who has had a previous cesarean can have external cephalic version. It can be an absolute, not a, an absolute contraindication, can be a relative one, but basically we should offer, um, because the chances of complications are the same as a person who has not had a previous one cesarean section. Um, other than that, the relative contraindications, which probably will make the external cephalic version not as successful are oligohydramnios if a person has intrauterine growth restriction or if there is some congenital anomaly in the baby. So where should external cephalic version take place and who should do that? The important thing is a person who's really trained to do external cephalic version should only do that, a senior person. And then it is also important that it is done at a hospital where there is the facility for cesarean section. You cannot do at a place because if there is, God forbid, some complication, we might have to immediately uh, go for a cesarean section. Another question that a person might ask you, what are the risks of complications because of this procedure? So we need to tell them the risks, uh, the complications are very rare, but the complications that can arise are abruptio placenta, rupture of the uterus, and also CTG abnormalities of the baby for which we might have to do an emergency cesarean section. So also we need to give uh, some medication so that we can relax the uterus and that actually makes external cephalic version quite successful. I personally like uh, using tabutaline but salbutamol is also used ideally half an hour before the procedure so 250 micrograms subcutaneously in case of a tabutaline we can give that injection and that can relax the uterus and then we start the procedure. So there is no need some people ask me that if we do a successful uh, version to cephalic, do we really need to induce labor at that time? No, not necessarily. So since I've told you in preming gravidas, we usually do it at after 36 weeks and it can be done at any time, 38 weeks, 37 weeks. So, uh, but we do not want to compromise the um, baby's gestation. So let her continue as normal and, and uh, there's no need to induce the labor.
I have an experience with external cephalic version of about 30 years. I'm re a real proponent of external cephalic version but because it really saves the person from uh, cesarean section and, and luckily I haven't seen any complication ever with any patient except for a transient bradycardia in the baby in few patients and transient means that within three minutes or four minutes the bradycardia settles so other than that i haven't seen any complication so that rare the complication is um, the second thing is that many people ask me that you know there was this concern that with one cesarean section are there any more chances of rupture uterus so rcog guidelines tell us that uh, with one cesarean we can easily go for uh, external cephalic version and I have done that after those guidelines came and I haven't seen it's any complication but the important thing is that you really have to select the patient and that is why it's a relative uh, thing so you have to see whether there are no other complications that can complicate the process so if it is simply because previous cesarean was done because of some fetal distress and two years have passed since the last childbirth you can offer external cephalic version to that person. So now I'm going to take you and I'll show you how an external cephalic version is done. So once we have taken the informed consent from the patient and we are, once we have given the injection tabutaline, we are going to ask the patient to lie down. But the most important thing here is to do an ultrasound to look at the placental position, to again look at the presentation, to look at the liker amount and volume, and also to see which side the back lies on. So I'm going to do the ultrasound first. And I'm going to have a look at all of these things. So once I'm sure, I can see that the back is on this side here. Now, since the patient is lying straight, it's better to give her a little left lateral tilt so that the blood supply goes to the baby. So this is how it is. I usually prefer that a woman has a little flexed legs and I place a pillow under the legs. So that usually helps to relax the woman as well. Many people ask me also that whether we need to empty the bladder of the woman. I do not prefer that because bladder actually keeps the head up. Of course, the bladder should not be so full that it becomes uncomfortable for the patient, but bladder um, empty karna is not necessary. So the first very important step is to disengage the breech from the pelvis. So that is important to get the breech off the pelvis and then take the help of an assistant and ask the assistant to please place their hand so that they can keep the breech here. So this is how and you know there is a pull that we do initially. So that means I am pulling the head and she is pulling the breech. Right. So this is how we initially do it and once the head is you know changes its position it comes here so we can also then use the push technique where we are going to push the head so that it comes down and it comes to this position. So once the ECV has been done we again confirm with the ultrasound if one attempt fails we can actually have four attempts of 10 minutes each and in between after every two minutes it's better to check the fetal hearts as well whether they are fine or not and once a successful version has been done it is good to have um, electronic fetal monitoring so that we can see that there is no transient bradycardia or there's no abnormality with the fetal heart rate right thank you